Let me see if I can send a message to everyone, though. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the webinar on the effects of climate change in inland fish and fisheries. Uh, we'll get started in about one minute. Hello, everybody. This is Davia Palmieri from the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, where we're going to be uh, exploring the effects of climate change in inland fish and fisheries. This webinar is sponsored by AFWA's Climate Change Committee and our Fisheries and Water Resources Policy Committee. So thank you all to the members of those committees that are in attendance, as well as uh, our friends and partners. So we're excited to be joined today by Bonnie Myers and Abigail Lynch from the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center at USGS, where they're going to share some of the results of large-scale syntheses they've completed with um, their partner, Craig Paukert, from the Missouri, Cooperative, the Missouri Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. Uh, so this is some synthesis work they've done over the last few years related to inland fish and fisheries and climate change. So there's a lot of material here, so I'll turn it over to them pretty quickly. Um, just a few logistics. Uh, everyone that's called in on the phone is on a global mute to minimize background noise. So if you have a question, please do enter it in the chat box and, or use the raise hand function, and I will uh, try to get to you right away. Um, if any other issues come up, use the chat box or the raise hand function, and I will uh, try to address those the best I can. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Bonnie and Abigail. Thank you for joining us. Great. Thanks, Davi. I really appreciate it. Um, this is Bonnie Myers, and um, as Davia mentioned, this um, project, well, I guess a few projects that we're going to talk about were really a collaboration with um, other university partners and then um, Craig Pockard at um, Missouri Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit at the University of Missouri. So we're definitely speaking on behalf of a large group of people who put in a lot of work um, for this for this effort. So I'm going to start off with um, talking about the effects of climate change on inland fish and fisheries at a global scale. Abby will go into the North American sort of perspective, and then um, we'll kind of tag team a little bit Craig's talk because he was unable to join us today, um, giving more of a management perspective side of things. So first, just to introduce myself and Davia, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, my name is Bonnie Myers. I'm a fish biologist at the United States Geological Survey National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. And then, Abby, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. And uh, my name is Abigail Lynch. I'm also with the U.S. Geological Survey and the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. Um, I'm, I'm a fish biologist here, and I'll give uh, the North American kind of uh, perspective for um, the, the, the piece of the webinar. And then, as Bonnie mentioned, we'll both tag team uh, the third section of the uh, webinar, which is uh, presented on behalf of our colleague, Craig Pockert. Um, who is with USGS, but with the Missouri Cooperative Fisheries Research Unit. Um, 
All right, so um, go ahead and dive right into focusing on the global synthesis of climate change impacts on inland fish that we uh, published, I guess, about six months ago um, in reviews in fish biology and fisheries, so we can definitely share that PDF after, after this talk. So just to start off with a little bit of why inland fish are so important and why we want to conduct this effort in the first place, 30% um, of all capture fisheries are from inland fish and about greater than 57 million um, are engaged in inland fisheries um, or post-harvest activities. And so inland fisheries really provide a lot of food security but then also income um, to a lot of uh, folks in developing countries and then also of course are very important recreational fish um, in Europe and North America. Um, and so like I mentioned, um, inland fisheries capture um, provides a lot of employment and supplemental income um, to those low income food deficit countries. And climate change is not the only stressor that are affecting inland fisheries. Um, as everyone knows, um, invasive species is also a problem as well as water pollution, uh, flow alteration, and then of course uh, recreational and commercial harvest. And so for example, in the Mekong River, uh, dams, the input of dams has a huge effect on the inland fisheries in that area. And so sometimes it's hard to tease out the effects of climate change on inland fisheries because of all the other stressors that are affecting um, the fish populations in, across the world. So this global synthesis effort really came about um, from the North American synthesis that Abby is going to talk about in more detail. Um, we had a workshop that was convened, and I won't go into specifics on this, um, that looked at the documented impacts of climate change on inland fisheries in North America. And we identified um, case studies where climate change impacts have already occurred on inland fish populations, and Abby's going to go into that a little bit more. But from that effort, we wanted to see if some of the trends we saw in North America held true to the global scale and really do a comparison of what scientists projected was going to happen and then what scientists have documented um, as of 2015 from when our literature review stopped. And so from, from the North American perspective, we found that um, inland fish respond in a variety of ways to climate change impacts. And so for the global synthesis, we decided to look at the various ways that climate change have and will impact inland fish. And these include um, response categories such as evolutionary changes, uh, demographic changes, so changes in abundance, growth, and recruitment, uh, distributional shifts, as well as changes in spawn timing and migration timing, and then species interactions, so new and novel interactions between species that uh, once didn't occur in the same area. And so for the uh, North American synthesis, um, one group looked at the physiological responses, and so these categories were based off of that, and then also some of the case studies that were identified in North America that Abby is going to go into. And this is just an example of one of those um, in the Rio Grande looking at changes in spawn timing of a fish assemblage in that river. And so just to go into the objectives for this work is we were looking to identify peer-reviewed studies with projected and documented effects of climate change on inland fish that were published between 1985 and 2015. And even as we were finishing up the analysis and publishing that, more studies were, were coming out that we identified um, in 2016 and 2017. Um, so 2015, of course, isn't just the end of things <laughs> and more stuff is coming out. Um, we wanted to qualitatively and quantitatively compare patterns um, geographically and then by species uh, and fish family and fish response and then also fish thermal guilds. So looking at how cold water, cool water, and warm water fish were being affected by climate change. And lastly, we wanted to identify the most commonly cited management recommendations that were found in some of these papers and others that we found for mitigating the potential effects of climate change on inland fish. So first off, we did a search of Google Scholar, but then also Web of Science, and identified a huge output of potential papers um, that identified a documented or project projected impact of climate change on inland fish. On inland fish. 
We didn't, of course, go through every single one of those papers. We had a cutoff. <laughs> but we identified about 656 um, papers based on the title and abstract that could potentially be relevant to this work. So we were really trying to focus on climate change and not climate variability. And there are a lot of papers out there that really focus more on the climate variability. And even though we realized that that is important, we decided that we had to focus, focus our um, effort um, a little bit more specifically to look at papers that really um, said that climate change was one of the potential impacts um, to inland fisheries in the study area. From those 656 papers, we then identified about 477 that were not relevant and or we removed some that were duplicates because of the, um, of the systematic literature review that we did. Uh, 63, um, after full text review, 63 were categorized as documented impacts of climate change, and then 116 um, were categorized as projected impacts, so predicting how climate change would affect inland fish using um, models and other data. And we found from 1985, which was our starting point, to 2015, that as you would expect, um, over time, especially from about 2008, um, the number of papers coming out projecting or documenting document impacts of climate change on inland fish have started to increase. And um, there are more projections um, thus far than documented impacts um, of climate change on inland fish, but it does appear that um, documented impacts, although 2015 is down a bit, um, are starting to increase as well. And so we split up these papers into where they occur geographically. Um, and we found that Europe and North America have the highest number of papers, both in, both in terms of what is being projected, um, what is being projected and then also documented. So Europe has about 55% of the documented impacts that are available, and then North America has about 44%. And I will say in Europe, um, there's one, one lake that there is a lot of studies that go on. So um, this isn't spread over Europe um, evenly by any means. And Abby will go into a little bit more of those North American documented impacts. So you'll definitely get into some case studies here soon. All right. So what we found overall um, was that the literature has a heavy, heavy focus on salmonids, so projecting or documenting the impacts of climate change on salmon and trout species, um, which considering they're very high in terms of recreational value is to be relatively expected. Um, and then perch and then other, other species kind of go down the line, but there was about uh, 80% or so of the papers, um, both documented and projected, were focused on those cold water fish species. And in terms of, in terms of cold water fish species, cool water fish species, and warm water fish species, the literature really tended to focus again on the cold water fish because of that salmonid trend. And then there has been a pickup, it seemed, um, in some of the work in looking at a combination of um, cool water, warm water, cold water species, and kind of seeing the interactions, interactions there. But still the literature is heavily focused on how climate change will impact those cold water fish species. All right, so we split up the documented and projected um, impacts, the literature that looked at both of these, into which fish response was studied that I mentioned earlier, looking at assemblage dynamics, demographic changes, so changes in abundance or growth, uh, distributional changes, evolutionary responses, and then changes in phenology, uh, so earlier migration or later spawning, things like that, and found that what is being projected and what is being documented, there's a bit of a mismatch there. Um, the demographic, dem the changes in uh, demographic rate were similar actually, so we were able to do some c comparisons there, but uh, projected the projected studies really focused heavily more so on changes in distribution of fish species rather than uh, the document which had a heavy focus on changes in uh, demographic rates and then phenological shifts as well. And so this made it a little bit difficult to do more of those quantitative comparisons uh, between the two study types. All right, 
Um, another thing we looked at was what climate change variable did researchers focus heavily on, and that is temperature only. So there were some papers looking at uh, temperature and precipitation, which was probably the, the second most common, but really papers were focusing mainly on how is temperature changes um, affecting fish populations. And this is interesting just in the fact of being able to guide future research in terms of we know that temperature is not the only thing impacting um, fish populations and having an impact on fish responses. And so you can see that there's definitely a need here uh, looking at other, other climate change variables rather than just temperature alone. Um, so looking a little bit more into the trends in fish responses. So as I mentioned, we divvied these up into different categories of fish. And some of the fish demographic responses that we saw were increases in salmonid, um, salmonid growth um, in certain temperature, um, certain increases in temperature, as well as uh, increases in perch growth. So European perch saw an increase in growth as temperatures increased as well. All right, in terms of fish phenological responses, across the board, um, there was a trend in earlier fish migration and spawn timing. Um, salmon and perch tended to spawn earlier as temperatures increased. However, European perch and Estonia um, exhibited earlier appearance but then later spawning. And so one thing I want to point out is there wasn't always consistent responses in the fish populations across the board. And there were other factors that were affecting how fish might respond to increases in temperature or changes in pre precipitation, including um, dependence on prey availability and then um, changes in water quality also um, affected the results um, in some of these papers. Uh, we also looked at um, research that was studying the impacts of climate change on evolutionary responses um, and then also changes in fish assemblage dynamics. These were a little bit more um, understudied in the literature, um, but there were some adaptive and non-adaptive responses um, that have been recently documented in the literature. One of our co-authors, Ryan Kovac, um, actually has done quite a bit of work um, looking at this in, in salmon in Alaska. Um, but evolutionary outcomes of climate change, um, as I mentioned, were relatively understudied. Um, some of the re resiliency of fish um, could be the result of plastic responses, and that might have later implications in life. And so some of, this, um, some of these impacts might not even be known at this point um, until more research is done. In terms of fish distributional responses, this is, of course, varied by species and then temperature guild, so um, cold water, cool water, warm water fish. Um, in general, since the majority of studies um, were on cold water species, um, there is a general trend of contraction in, um, in distributions. However, um, one notable study that Abby's going to talk about even more is the expansion of smallmouth bass in Ontario. All right, so I wanted to delve in a little bit um, deeper into the management strategies that the papers highlighted for dealing with some of these responses, um, fish responses to climate change. And these included fishing regulations to increase season lengths and allowable harvest of fish um, benefiting from climate change. Um, there were a lot of recommendations for maintaining environmental flows to retain habitat connectivity at different life stages. Um, and these are specific to changes in, um, in demographic rates, so growth in abundance, um, conserving or restoring critical habitats for fish populations, and then reducing nutrient input in lakes um, to decrease the coupled eutrophication and climate change effects on demographic rates. Um, some of the other ones were using slot size limits to reduce harvest of life, stage, life stages vulnerable to climate change. And then also some longer term, um, longer term management or research strategies is analyzing long term data sets and increasing monitoring to understand uh, species capacity to respond to environmental change. And then also incorporating density dependent dynamics um, when trying to determine the effects of climate change on populations. And we have this, um, we can share these slides and then also have a table in our, in our paper that we published if you're interested in seeing the citations for these. Um, some of the management recommendations 
for um, for managing or mitigating for distributional changes in fish response to climate change are again restoring connectivity among habitats, um, <laughs> which this is a constant theme throughout. Um, increasing riparian shading and temporary, gra temporary groundwater pumping um, and, um, to increase summer refugia. Uh, promoting um, unlimited harvest of newly established non-native fish species. So again, um, using fishing regulations um, for those recreational species um, is a common theme throughout and then increasing long-term monitoring to uh, study climate change and multiple stressors on distributions. We try to focus mainly on management strategies, but then of course some research strategies kind of snuck in there. <laughs> um, so so um, managing for changes in assemblage dynamics, so novel and new communities um, that are being impacted by climate change, so establishing freshwater protected areas, um, with one example, increasing access to um, the amount of thermal refugia for species in assemblages sensitive to warming, and then developing decision support tools for management um, that could incorporate those assemblage dynamics and multiple stressors. In terms of phenological changes, so managing for earlier spawning or uh, later mi migration is buffering populations from phenological um, asynchrony by maintaining diverse age structures. And there's a really interesting example that Abby's going to talk about a little bit um, more about how these changes in migration t or spawn timing can really affect the communities and how they interact with one another. Um, altering fishing season regulations in response to changes in spawning and quantifying conserving phenological diversity to increase population's resilience uh, to climate change. And lastly, um, just in general, increasing flexibility and adaptability in monitoring programs. So the last one I want to talk about is what are some, what are some research or management strategies that can be used to respond to changes in evo um, evolutionary responses of fish, and that's isolating at-risk uh, genetic strains to limit hybridization, uh, limiting fish stocks to reduce introgression between native strains and stock strains, uh, maintaining as much as possible native genetic life history and phenotypic diversity um, by monitoring those strains and then monitoring those strains and then establishing uh, metapopulations. And lastly, again, with the increased monitoring, uh, just to determine factors associated with um, highest non-native recruitment and hybridization. And so just to point out some key points that we found um, looking through all these papers and going through each one to tease out the fish responses uh, to climate change that the, that the researchers found was there are really major geographic and taxonomic gaps um, at a global scale. So there's a huge focus on salmonids and cold water fish species, even though um, papers that research cool water or warm water species definitely saw an impact of climate change on those populations. And so there's definitely a real need to expand um, the work to um, not just focusing on those cold water fish. And then differences in what researchers are documenting and projecting. Um, that was one major sort of future research um, goal that we identified is really trying to connect what we're projecting um, and then trying to document or trying to verify if those projections are actually correct. And then changes, or excuse me, and then uh, just in general, fish response patterns were not always consistent and were very much site dependent. And so although we tried to make some general, uh, general conclusions and identify some trends more generally, um, a lot of the, the results were based on the other stressors that were in those sites that were being studied. And so that's just something to keep in mind um, in terms of trying to determine how climate change will affect inland fish. Um, second to last is important to consider both the shorter term and then longer term impacts of climate change. And then just some common management strategies that um, we identified were across fish responses is to maintain and restore connectivity using fishing regulations to manage for changes and then conserving or restoring critical habitat. Um, and so with that, I think we'll probably take questions at the very end, but I'll let Abby go ahead and um, start and focus in on the, the North American perspective. 
Great. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, again, my name is Abigail Lynch, and, and I'll be stepping down and, and scale to uh, talk just about uh, more of a focus on North American fish at this point. And um, so this, this part of the talk actually came about as a result of a workshop that we held in Bozeman, Montana. Um, and this photo is just showing two of the, the participants that, that were in that workshop. Um, from USGS and the Wisconsin DNR. And this, the aim of this workshop was really to provide an assessment of North American inland fish in the context of climate change. Um, you know, we worked with the American Fishery Society and, and, and um, determined that there was a distinct need to have this large scale synthesis of climate impacts on North American inland fish and that nothing to, to date had existed. And um, the goal for our workshop was really to aim to, to focus on documented impacts because we wanted to um, synthesize things to show exactly how climate change was already impacting fish. Um, and from that, we ended up inviting 30 participants um, from across North America, and these individuals were from state federal and um, also university, like academic backgrounds. Um, and we divided the, the working groups, uh, we, we divided the participants into four working groups um, with four kind of focuses for their, uh, the discussions at the, the workshop. And so the first working group focused on uh, looking at physiological and individual level impacts. The second one, um, which we'll, I'll, I'll delve into a little bit more deeply uh, in this webinar, looked at population and community impacts on inland fish. Uh, the third working group looked at the human dimensions component, and then the last working group looked at management, and, and we'll conclude this webinar with some of the outcomes from that working group discussion. And so um, just to, to go over uh, who the team was and, and, and where, where we all came from. Um, this is a photo showing the group a, after, at the workshop, but again, we came from across North America, um, from both federal organizations, state and provincial level organizations, and also um, from universities. And so um, just to go briefly into the results of this workshop, which um, one of which ended up being um, moving on to uh, the project that Bonnie just presented on as a, as a follow-up for that, but um, from the specific outcomes from the North American activities, uh, first we did a, a publication which became a special issue in, in Fisheries Magazine on climate change, and this was released last summer, I think in July 2016, and again, um, each of those working groups kind of had a, a synthesis uh, manuscript within that, again, the first one was on physiology, the second was on populations and communities, uh, the third was on human dimensions, and the fourth was on, on management and adaptation. Um, and we're happy to share any and all of, of those uh, articles with you if, if there's of interest. Um, we can go through um, AFWA to, to do so. Um, in addition to producing that, that publication, we also participated in a number of different events to um, share this information in other, other ways. Um, we held uh, a couple of different symposia, first at the World Fisheries Congress, which was in Busan, Korea last summer, and then um, also at the American Fisheries Society annual meeting last summer in Kansas City. Um, all of these were, were kind of on the tail end of when, when this publication was released. Um, additionally, we were able to present this in a Capitol Hill briefing, um, again, last fall, um, just to present this to policymakers and, and those within um, the federal government system. And then we've also done a number of different outreach events. Um, this is a photo of, of uh, Bonnie and I with, with Craig Pockert. Um, we did one at the Smithsonian Institute here in D.C. Um, so to get into a bit more specifics on uh, the effects of climate change on North American inland fish populations and assemblages, this is just a, a screenshot of the, um, the, the article from that, that special issue of Fisheries Magazine. And again, um, what I'm going to be presenting on now, it all comes from, from that article, and we're happy to share that with anyone who's interested in it. Um, and just to acknowledge my co-authors on the, the publication before moving forward, um, as you can see, 
uh, it was it was a, a definitely a large group effort, and um, our co-authors came from from diverse places. And, and I just wanted to highlight that um, both Cindy and John came from state management agencies. So even though our, our focus was more on um, the research component, you know, we always had an eye to, to management in, in this uh, manuscript as well. So um, in terms of synthesizing the key points from um, the outcomes of our working group, uh, essentially uh, we found, and, and you'll note that the, there's some echoing of, of findings from, from what Bonnie presented earlier, uh, North American inland fish populations are shifting their spatial distribution and timing of key behaviors. And that's uh, thinking in terms of migration and spawning due to climate change. And again, um, just to emphasize, we were focusing on documented imp impacts. So um, in our research to synthesize these studies, we were able to find examples where these things are already occurring. Um, again, um, in terms of patterns of growth and, and population dynamics, Climate change is already having an impact, and uh, like Bonnie mentioned earlier, um, this is particularly uh, evident in cold water fishes. And um, something that, that you don't necessarily think in terms of, of short-term uh, impacts, but, but um, evolutionary responses so, such as, uh, for example, just natural selection um, have already been shown to have impacts in uh, salmon and trout. So climate change is already, at this point, having documented evolutionary responses in North American fish. And lastly, um, thinking through uh, transitions of species, ranges, climate change is, uh, is already having documented modifications on North American aquatic communities and um, causing things like novel species interactions and predator-prey mismatches. Um, so again, uh, following a similar sort of approach to what Bonnie presented in the global um, synthesis project that we worked on, when we were doing this at, at a North American scale, we, we conducted a, a large literature review. And again, we were looking at documented effects of climate change. So we were looking at, um, while, while we recognize that climate variability is, is important and, and um, contributes to our understanding of these impacts, uh, we focused our, our research on looking at climate change and not climate variability. Um, and based on, on when we conducted this study, we were looking at the years 1985 to 2015. Um, we did this through a peer-reviewed publication search and um, as you can tell, in comparison to Bonnie's study, um, again, looking just at documented impacts in North America, we were only able to identify 31 studies that, that fit our criteria. So quite a few less than, than the global scale one, but, but these studies all contributed into Bonnie's global presentation that she just um, discussed. So um, where were those 31 studies and, and how are they spread across the North American landscape. Um, uh, this is a figure from, from that publication. Um, and, and, and you can see by the, well, just to start with the inset map, um, uh, which is a similar sort of graph to what Bonnie presented on the global scale, um, the number of studies looking at documented impacts of climate change on North American in, inland fish has um, markedly increased over time. Um, there are a few studies back in the, the, the 90s, but, but really um, the trend has increased in the past uh, five or 10 years. And, um, and in terms of where those studies are on the landscape, um, you can see from the map that they, they are kind of pockets of, of areas where um, there's more research being conducted. Um, just to orient you with this, the, the legend, um, again, these are similar, uh, all the same sort of um, uh, types of different change that, that Bonnie had mentioned. So again, when, um, the, orange the orange dots are demographic changes. Um, the red ones are phenological shifts, again, looking at migration and spawning. Um, the black dots are distributional changes. Um, the, the green ones are looking at assemblage structure changes. 
and um, the blue dot is looking at community processes, and then the purple dots are looking at evolutionary change. And you can just see from um, where these studies are occurring, we have um, pockets of, of um, areas which are more heavily studied than others. A lot of them are focused on Salmonids in, in Alaska and on the West Coast, um, some others within the Great Lakes area, and, and then also in the Northeast. And just to point out a few of these studies, um, which we'll go into in, in a little more detail um, in the upcoming slides, one of, one of the case studies that we'll look at is sockeye in, in Alaska. Another is looking at West Slope cutthroat trout in Montana. And um, a third one um, that Bonnie had mentioned earlier is looking at smallmouth bass in Ontario. And so first to, to look at um, distribution and phenology. Um, there were four studies in, in our um, literature search that documented distributional change. Um, that essentially, um, to, to, to simplify what, what, what they all presented, it essentially meant um, increases in, in distribution for warm and cool water fish and decreases in distributional ranges for cold water fish. There were 15 different studies that we found that documented phenological shifts, again, looking at timing and migration of spawning. And these studies had, had um, less clear, um, clearly defined directional results. Um, for example, um, we had an example of, of yellow perch uh, in one study. Um, fall, so looking at yellow perch in with earlier springs following shorter winters, so uh, a change as a result of climate change. Um, one study found that they spawn sooner in Lake Erie, and then another study found that they spawn later in Lake Michigan. So there, there's a number of other um, variables and, and um, impacts that need to be teased out more than just thinking in terms of uh, basic uh, changes in climate uh, and seasonality. Looking to demographic processes, we had seven studies in our, our cohort um, that documented changes in, in abundance, growth, and recruitment. Um, as an example, most of these focused, uh, similar to, to what Bonnie had mentioned at the global scale, most of these focused on temperature increases in cold water fish. Um, and the results of that it mostly was a decline in growth and abundance. And these are just three examples of um, Salmonids, uh, Arctic char, Cisco, and Chinook that all had decreases in, in growth and abundance. But um, there were other examples of, of increase in uh, increases, um, such as uh, these few studies looking at sockeye salmon and also the black basses, which are, are, are not cold water fish. Um, it, moving on to evolutionary processes, uh, within North America, there were three studies that documented climate change induced change, uh, evolutionary change. Um, and, and this is a result of either adaptive changes due to natural selection or um, potentially maladaptive changes due to interspecific hybridization. So um, an example of that is um, here looking at uh, rainbow trout and um, the increase in, in rainbow trout, which is a non-native species in Flathead River, Montana. Um, when rainbow trout increased, um, there was an increase in hybridization between the native West Slope cutthroat trout and, and rainbow trout. And as a result of this increase in hybridization, um, there was a decrease in pure West Slope cutthroat trout. And I, I should mention that the increase in rainbow trout um, was due to uh, climate change in that the um, habitat was more suitable for rainbow trout to expand into that range, uh, not, not just from being um, artificially introduced um, to the system. Uh, next, looking at assemblage structure, we had four different studies that, that documented climate change induced changes in species interactions. And um, this, as Bonnie had also mentioned, is, is really looking at novel communities as a result of, of a, a specific species changing its range. 
um, and it it also results in um, phenological mismatches, and, and this is important when you're thinking in terms of predator-prey dynamics and, and um, thinking, uh, for example, of larval recruitment if, if they're not able to um, time their hatch with the, the, the t period when their, their um, food source is available, um, the impacts of that on populations. And the poster child example that, that we um, seem to use quite often with this project is, is really looking at smallmouth bass. And so um, this is one example um, study that, that looked at smallmouth bass. And, and as smallmouth bass are increasing their, their species range into um, southern Ontario, um, when they're increasing their range, they, they need to eat. And so um, at that point, uh, you know, they're, they're coming into new territory and they're eating um, the native cyprinids and, and um, bait fish <laughs> within the system. And as a result of, of them um, moving into these waters, the, the prey fish are um, reducing in their species range further north. So. Um, essentially, the, the um, smallmouth bass are eating out the, the native communities um, as they're expanding the range. And this is all a, a new community interaction because these species weren't um, ever present in the same uh, location before climate change uh, expanded the range of smallmouth bass. And um, so just to emphasize, as as Bonnie had mentioned earlier, um, it's difficult when you think of climate change um, because you have to consider all of these other different factors that, that are um, acting at the same time as climate change and often on a, a very much smaller time scale. Um, so it, it really is difficult to tease apart just impacts of climate um, and especially when there's all these other additional anthropogenic stressors. And um, so one of the challenges that we found through this study and just thinking in terms of, of climate change work in general, um, it, it's, it's very challenging to separate out the relative effects of, of one stressor versus the other. And often it's, it's a combination of, of all of them. Um, and so thinking in terms of those needs, our, our, our workshop ended up coming up with, with a large host of, of different research needs to, to move forward from this point um, and, and thinking in terms of climate and management and where to go from there. So um, as you'll note um, with the North American study and also the global study, there's definitely a need to look beyond distribution. So um, generally when we think in terms of climate change, a lot of the work we see is, is species range is changing, but it's really, um, again, beyond just moving species, how are these species changing um, in their interactions with others and, and what impacts do those have on uh, management and, and um, the management community. Um, as Bonnie had mentioned, um, there's a more projected studies than there are documented studies. And um, moving forward, I think it's important for us to, to think in terms of um, we have this range of different projections, but um, trying to ground truth so with, with documented studies where that's possible. Um, and again, you know, some of these projected studies were from uh, decades ago at this point, and, and we're now in a position where we are able to start considering that. Um, Again, as Bonnie had mentioned, there is a, a, a geographic and taxonomic focus on salmonids and other um, economically important species. And so um, in terms of, of the synthesis and, and kind of larger scale findings that, that we can present, it, we just have to recognize that, that those are um, for certain areas and for certain groups of fish. Um, in terms of moving forward, and, and, and a lot of climate change research often um, is seen in kind of a, a doom and gloom scenario, um, we saw a, a major need in, in that we can look in understanding sources of, of resilience, so what makes certain species um, more able to adapt to different conditions, and, and, and what ways can we use management to increase 
the resilience of, of these systems to change. Um, looking at more community level dynamics, um, monitoring will have to come into play in terms of that, in terms of, 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 of looking at before and after scenarios. Um, again, as, as we've both mentioned, it's, it's hard to just consider climate change in a bubble, and if you do, you're not considering the, the, the full suite of, of impacts from other things, so um, recognizing that there are confounding stressors and, and considering those are important to do. Um, and looking beyond just our fish discipline and, and looking at other, uh, other um, interdisciplinary approaches will be useful moving forward with this, this large-scale problem. And then lastly, um, we see that the decision support tools are important, especially in the management sphere. So um, just to, to close off this uh, section of the presentation, um, in terms of take home messages, uh, we found that climate change is already causing significant changes in North American inland fish communities. Um, these changes include altered abundance, growth, and migration. Um, evidence is, is definitely more pronounced in cold water systems. And it's important to, to recognize that climate change interacts with other human-related factors, um, making direct causes of such changes difficult to determine and measure. So um, as, as Bonnie presented this before, um, this is just a, an example from uh, the outputs of, of the working group that, that we were in. Um, and again, this can be found um, on our website or, or on um, related to, to the manuscripts in that special issue of Fisheries Magazine. Um, so just to transition now to thinking more about uh, taking those synthesis projects from um, the, the research community and moving those to the management sphere, um, Bonnie and I are going to tag team th this next piece um, looking at um, examples from, from our colleague Craig Par Pockert and the, and the manuscript that he put together, which is also um, again, in that special issue of Fisheries Magazine. And um, just to also note his uh, co-authors on the project, we had a few more folks that were from um, management uh, communities that, that were a part of this process. And, um, I, well, I guess, Bonnie, where do, where do you want to jump in? Do you want to jump in here? Or are you um, if you want to do the background, I can Okay, then, yeah. okay. so um, I'll just continue with, with the background here. So um, again, going back to what we, we had hosted that workshop in Bozeman, and one of the, the um, main four groups that we wanted to, to have as our themes for, for developing this special issue was looking at um, management. And um, it, when we talk about climate change and um, climate change adaptation, Many of us think of adaptation only in the space of, of the organism, so thinking about um, you know, how an organism will adapt to a changing environment, but we wanted to emphasize that you know, in addition to how fish respond and change to climate, um, there's an important element of how managers do as well. And so um, this, this piece and this component was really looking at how um, we can uh, provide means to information to help managers understand um, these climate change impacts and and how they can use um, adaptation strategies to to work within this sphere. And so, when you think of uh, management tools that are traditionally held um, for fisheries managers, um, including harvest regulation, stocking, and habitat enhancement, all of these these measures can be applied in, in the context of climate change. And any sort of effort um, used to improve habitat and habitat space um, will also um, contribute to um, increasing resilience for climate change conditions. And so the, the objectives of, of this last uh, manuscript piece were really to identify the key components of management for fisheries under climate change, so looking at 
um, ecological resilience, again, that organism level resilience, and then management resilience, so looking at the adaptive capacity of the managers, and then using monitoring as a tool to be able to um, estimate um, how both ecological and management efforts are, are changing. And so um, th this group found uh, the use of case studies particularly helpful, so, um, and, and looked at, at reviewing adaptation strategies and organizations that are using these sorts of resilience elements. And so um, through the rest of the presentation, we'll go through three key examples. The first one being um, how to maintain or optimize cold water habitat in, in Minnesota lakes. The second one is, uh, again, continuing on with that smallmouth bass example, um, looking at Ontario, um, Ontario management strategies. And then the last one is looking at Florida's climate change adaptation strategies for their, their natural resource agency. Yeah, so um, just some key components I guess we'll go into um, is for ecological resilience, just the ability for a system, as Abby was talking about, to absorb or recover from disturbance and then maintaining the diversity of the size structure in fish population, so trying to minimize year class failure. Um, maintaining um, species diversity, so um, levels of species richness, and then not just having a single species management um, with specific goals, trying to look at the, at the environment in a little bit more of a holistic fashion, um, and then understanding the social context, so how will anglers respond to um, the effects of the, the management strategies that are being implemented um, in these certain areas. Um, and so um, some types of those resilient management systems is management designed to adapt to rapidly uh, changing ecological and social conditions. So really um, having an idea of um, how things are changing um, on not a day-to-day -day basis, but how things are, are changing in real time and then adapting um, management strategies to um, then deal with those changes. Um, and some examples of what agencies may need to do is um, having the capacity to adapt and then change their management um, strategies quickly rather than um, just having maybe a five-year plan and then um, implementing it every five years. Um, being proactive when possible. Um, obviously, it won't always be uh, possible to be proactive um, in certain situations in terms of you might not see the effects until years down the road. But um, some examples are um, planning riparian uh, zone where temperatures are likely to increase, um, which was a management strategy identified um, um, in, the, in the global synthesis. And then also being flexible um, with stakeholder expectations. Um, so continuing to have um, active outreach and education to stakeholders to try to um, consistently understand what their needs are and, and what sort of issues um, they might be running into. And then um, also continuing to monitor to have an idea of how the system is changing um, over time. Um, and so one example is monitoring and ecological resil resilience is the Cisco declines um, linked to loss of oxythermal um, habitat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want me? To, do you yeah, want me to I'll go through? Like okay. That. So um, just to, to tag team back over. So uh, essentially, um, through a, a long-term management, long-term monitoring protocol, um, Minnesota DNR was able to document that the Cisco declines were linked to loss of this habitat, and so in terms of what they could do as a management agency, they um, knew that if they could add. Um, more riparian cover and um, include other management actions to help maintain the cooler habitat, um, they would able to provide Cisco refuges within the watershed. So um, essentially they, they, they set about this forest stewardship project um, which, which helped maintain clean, clear water, uh, clean, clean cold water for the Cisco populations um, by uh, encouraging um, landowners to um, plant trees and um, in, include invasive species control and, and help 
um, combat erosion. And so this was an activity that um, could be accomplished through other management means to protect um, a cold water fish that was um, undergoing decline uh, based on, on a change in their habitat as a result of climate and land use patterns. So, uh, and to return to a, another example of, of how uh, monitoring is, is important um, to not only improve the ecological resilience of the system, but also um, ensure that the management strategies are, are properly, um, management strategies are, are effective in addressing the, their um, anticipated needs. Um, looking to this expansion of smallmouth bass into Ontario lakes. Um, again, smallmouth bass are non-native in, in, in Ontario's inland lakes. Uh, it further north in Ontario, they are, they are native in, in the southern edge of Ontario. Um, but as they've been shifting their distribution northward, the, there is um, an impact on the other uh, fish community within these inland lakes. And so what management effort, ha what, what Ontario has done um, is change the, the management for smallmouth bass to encourage um, earlier season open, openings for certain regions where they're trying to target smallmouth bass removal and um, also removing seasonal protection from um, non-native, from smallmouth bass in areas where they're non-native. So using, again, uh, more traditional fisheries management uh, techniques, but in the context of climate change to address a, a new concern um, and to the benefit of, of what they see as, as uh, an objective of their management strategies. Um, and so the, the last one that uh, we're going to present was from um, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, I believe, um, but that Bob uh, Glaser, per Glaser presented to the workshop. Um, and this was an effort in 2008 to build internal capacity for dealing with uh, climate change and its effect on um, and fishes. And so they developed working groups, which then they had meetings over um, a nine-month certification course um, and had monthly workshops um, to discuss to discuss the impacts of climate change and then also how management adaptation and then research and monitoring can then be used to, um, to mitigate or deal with the effects of climate change on fish. Um, and this led to increased buy-in um, by the managers at, at local scales. And so what they found is really um, engaging those stakeholders um, over time and um, on a consistent basis really helped to, to identify sort of a um, strategic plan and then actions for um, dealing with climate change um, in Florida. And then just in summary uh, for this section, so managers can cope with climate change by developing resilient ecological and management systems. Um, monitoring the resource, so fish in, in this case, and users um, may be needed. And then also partners um, are needed given the scale of the management needs. So not only one agency um, can do it alone, but really engaging all the various stakeholders and partners that, are, um, that use the land and, and the resource um, are needed to um, best manage and, and adapt to the changes of, of climate change and the effects on inland fish. <laughs> so with that, um, I think we'll take any questions, and thanks so much for listening. And it looks like there were a few that came through um, yeah. in the chat box, um, so I don't know if, Bonnie, you want to start with that first one from Jason? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, thanks Jason, and uh, Jason just um, correctly um, corrected me on a, a comment that I made in one of the papers at PASCO at L, suggesting that our Harvest is always a viable solution, and sorry about that. I definitely did not mean to say it was always um, viable, and that just um, that could be a suggestion, uh, suggested research management strategy that was identified in other papers as well. But it's always more analysis, as Jason mentioned, is what their recommendation was. Um, more analysis is always needed um, to really um, make sure there is a better understanding of the potential management solutions, um, and that was directly related to the. Um, dealing with invasive species. 
Great. Thank you, Jason. Great. And, and thanks, Hal. And it looks like we have another question from Janet. Um, looking at uh, how our program will be um, looking at ongoing um, inland fisheries efforts and, and what are the most immediate targets priorities. Um, yeah, I, I, just to, to follow on that, you know, the, these, these research projects um, on the, the large scale syntheses have all built from one to the next and um, we've had uh, folks within the, the management and larger community um, identify these as, as needs um, to have these large-scale syntheses. So we, we will continue to do efforts um, to, to conduct these larger-scale projects and then in terms of um, other kind of research priorities that, that we identified as a group through these activities. Um, I know our program in specific is, is looking more towards um, adaptation as, as a key focus and, and how um, not only uh, we can look to adaptation for the organisms such as inland fish or wildlife in the case of our program, but also um, in terms of management strategies that can be um, more resilient to change. So yeah. I don't know, Bonnie, you want to add anything in that? Well, there's just one thing I was going to mention in terms of some, um, I don't know if it's future research priorities, but we are trying to develop an online database that houses all of these papers and then mm -hmm. also um, with the ability to upload new papers because as we were finishing that global synthesis, more and more papers were coming out and just having all of this information in one central location that um, researchers and then managers can go to to kind of see what other, what other folks are studying and what, and what they're finding in terms of um, the impacts on inland. Okay, so um, we have a, a question from from uh, Christopher. Uh, Bonnie, I guess that's probably... Um, yeah, I can read it. So, um, um, suggest, um, so it just says, suggest you add water levels and volumes to ecological flow considerations to include limit habitats, not just loaded mm -hmm. systems as part of your assessment. Yeah. Mentioning ecological flow doesn't necessarily integrate uh, Olympic water level and water volume considerations and assessments that are critical to Reflorida. Uh, what about the estuarine? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's a good point. So um, it, there is a lot more information um, that we can synthesize. So we did leave out estuaries in the, in the global synthesis. But um, I think that that could be um, an area a future. To, yeah. yeah, an area of need. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, it's, it's tough to, especially when you're, you're thinking and um, putting the, the sounding board on where, where to cut off um, doing kind of these large scale literature reviews because you have to kind of give some bounding edge, but um, there's definitely room for expansion mm -hmm. for sure. This is Davia. I had one more question. Um, one of the, the key points, takeaways um, that you shared is that the evidence of climate impacts is most pronounced in cold water systems. Mm -hmm. uh, do you guys get a sense that that's because that's where we're looking for these impacts, or is that really where the impacts are the greatest? Yeah, that's, that is a, um, a definite question that comes up uh, frequently. and, and um, at this point, so we can say that those impacts are there because they have been studied, but I think it's harder to always document them in, in the warmer water systems because um, the, the range of change is, is often different and, and often um, in these cold water uh, salmon, salmon and trout streams are often more pristine than some of the warmer water environments and so as a result, um, it's easier to define climate as, as a driver, um, whereas in, in warmer water systems where there are often um, additional stressors, it, it's harder to tease out the pattern. So um, I would hypothesize that it's not um, that the, the factors or the effects are not there in the warmer water systems, it's just more difficult to, to tease them out from other stressors. Yeah, and I think that's highlighted um, at least in one of the case studies uh, that's in the North American synthesis um, where um, really talking about the com complex stressors and um, just showing that climate change was really hard to 
uh, identify, identify in, the, in, in that situation because there were so many other factors and maybe factors that were affecting the populations more so than climate change. Yes, yeah. and, and I guess, uh, and one other follow-up point on that, you know, um, while the, the changes may be smaller in, in the warmer water systems, often um, the species are, are less adapted to more um, variability. So mm -hmm. um, it's not that they're not um, susceptible to, to potential change, it's just more difficult to identify it as a cause. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we are four minutes past two o'clock already, so I don't want to um, uh, impose on everybody's time any longer, but thank you so much. Um, Bob yeah, thank, thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank um, you so much, and thanks everyone for joining and listening, and, and feel free to contact Abby or I if you have any questions or, or want us to send any materials. Yeah, and, and um, our email addresses are, are displayed here on this last screen, and, and the other folks on the screen are the other um, co-leads from our, our Bozeman workshop. So. Um, any of us would be happy to be in touch if you have um, further follow-up questions. Thank okay. you again for the opportunity to share this. Sure. And, and this webinar was recorded, so um, as some follow-up to the group, we'll send out the webinar recording as well as the papers that you guys referenced, so people have those. Um, and again, thanks so much for attending. Um, for those of you that are members of AFLA committees, just Remember that AFLA, uh, AFLA's annual meeting is only two weeks away, so hopefully we'll see a bunch of you there. And um, thanks for joining. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Great. Thank you Thank very you much. Again. Have a good day.